being able to study and paddle alongside was really useful. It's something that still, I think, is really important to kind of have a second focus. Yeah. Because, I mean, whatever we're doing, especially if we're pursuing high performance or something, you know, there's probably a lot more bad days than there are good days, you know? Adam Burgess. Adam Burgess from Team GB. Pretty formidable under 23 world champion from a couple of years back now. If one area is not quite motivating you and lighting you up at that time, mm. then hopefully the other thing you're pursuing is. I'm here with Adam Burgess. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Absolute pleasure. Um, let's kick things off with canoeing. Can you tell me, first of all, where did canoeing begin for you? Um, when did you first get into a canoe? Who was it with? Where was the location? Can you kind of remember back and just talk us through that? Mm. So I started out on the River Trent in Stone, which... If you saw it compared to the whitewater venues that I compete on now, you'd see it's you know very humble beginnings, yeah. pretty much a stream at that point. I'd, I'd tried canoeing once or twice before um, through the scouts and through some family friends as well. And an opportunity came along at school to join the local club. And it's, it's mad. It blows my mind still that I've, it's become my career mm. and really shaped who I've become because the the opportunity was there for eight kids to start off. And it was one of those things where you had to get your permission slip signed by your parents to say you're allowed <laughs> to go. Yeah. And that bit of paper just lived scrumpled up in the bottom of my bag, never saw the light of day. I kind of wanted to do it, um, but you know, I was, I was into all sorts of other things at the time. So when I missed out, I, I wasn't too disappointed, but someone dropped out about six weeks in and it was my form tutor who had the connection with the club and she just brought it up one morning. Oh, by the way, someone stopped out of the canoeing. Would anyone like to do it? And I was 10 years old and I can vividly remember just raising my hand in that classroom and being like, yeah, like I'll give it a go. And yeah, it was it was just meant to be a hobby at the start. Mm. So just yeah, still really does blow my mind that it must do because that is one of those sliding door moments, mm. that kind of serendipity that. Um, and I guess you know you you, you can visualise yourself like putting your hand up, but you obviously have no idea what triggered your brain to literally make that action. Yeah, to the teacher. Exactly. Yeah, and you know. I've got uh, Ashley, his name was, the kid who dropped out. I've got, <laughs> I got a lot to thank him for. <laughs> and that was like 20 years ago, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And did you enjoy it straight away, like that first mm. session that you, you went in and you joined that group that had already um, started? Yeah, I, I loved it straight away. And I mean, because I started behind the rest of the group, I was well behind for quite mm. a long time. So okay. I was getting beaten by the girls to start with and... Nothing wrong with that. Which is there, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, but um, yeah, it was, I, I quite quickly sort of dropped everything else I was doing. Did you? And I was only around 12 when it was the Athens Olympics mm. in 2004. Mm. And I watched um, the British guy, Campbell Walsh, he's now a coach at British Canoeing, watched him win silver at that Olympics. And pretty much from that moment, I was kind of like, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. Really? Mm. And it, if someone had said to you at that age, and maybe they did, you know, careers in, in school, et cetera, what do you want to do when you, when you grow up, Adam? Was that the answer? Yeah, 100%. I, I remember wow. saying it in school to teachers. Um, I, think, um, I think at the time Campbell might have still been studying or he had done recently. I remember saying, I want to be an athlete and I want to be a student. That was the things I was saying at the time. Um, so yeah, that kind of, what did you want to be when you grew up? I literally achieved that, which I'm, you know, immensely proud of that. Yeah. And how many people will never know the answer to that, but mm. how many people actually do what they say you can do? Even, even I know when I kind of reflect back at being at university and stuff, it's like, I don't know any of us who are actually doing what we went to do <laughs> at university, mm. you know? Um, so that's amazing that you, you did that. That is amazing. Um, and how did you you, you fit it in? Because you said you, you you took to it straight away at mm. school and it soon, you know, became, you know, your most passionate thing. How did you fit it in with, with school? Did you have competitions going on from a really young age? 
Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of strain on, um, on my parents, particularly my mum, you know, a lot of driving on weekends, late I'm, nights. Kit washing. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> the river Trent in stone. It's not the best, particularly if there's been rain. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I had something different on pretty much every night of the week after school and yeah, quite quickly just wanted to go canoeing instead. I, I remember being sort of, I was maybe around 14 when I realized, um, since I was walking past the canoe club every morning on my way to school, I was like, there's no reason why I can't just come with my kit and start going before school. I could train just after. There's the evening sessions where, where we usually go. And I sort of remember identifying these sort of three windows for training every day and um, thinking, yeah, well, if I can hit two of those every day. Um, so some days I'd train before school. Some days I'd go twice afterwards. Wow. I just loved it from the word go. Um, oh, wow, wow. So that's guess quite quite a commitment for a, for a, for a teenager mm. to do as well, and it's t typically those years that a lot of kids drop out of playing playing sports as well. But for you, you doubled down on it by the sound of it. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, part I just love being on the water. It's mm. it, it's so technical canoe slalom. There's I'm, I'm still figuring it out, <laughs> and um, there's that, and then there's the competition side as well. It helps. It helps when you're good at it. Yeah. You know, when you're good at something, it's motivating. Um, I like to win. I like to chase that next step. The really good thing about my canoe club, Stafford and Stone, was that I think even at that young age, you could sort of see the whole pathway. Okay. So we had an Olympian at the club um, who competed in Sydney when I first started, Laura Blakeman, and but also there was someone just in the division higher than me. There was someone who's just made the junior team for the first time. Right. The under 23 is a senior. Mm. So you could sort of, it didn't seem like that big distant goal because you yep. could see that people from our area on this river have achieved that. And I think that's why it was, yeah, it was just such a motivating place to be. That must be, and that must, you know, not, not make it easier, but if you can, it, compared to somebody just, seeing like on a tv and i always think of that that famous movie with the with the bobslayers from like jamaica mm -hmm. and you just think they've never even actually been in an environment where there's snow or ice or anything yeah. like that and they're just seeing this on the tv but for you to be able to identify that, that these are the next steps on that on that mm. road to get you to where you wanted to be must have been helpful and was there much interaction from say like the 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 olympian who would who uh who'd been to the olympics and yeah um, so we saw these people Every and that day. was the thing. So, yeah. and still, so Staff and Stone run this series in the winter, the mini slaloms. And, you know, that's, that's an event that if I'm in the UK, I'll make sure I go there. Yeah. Because I know how stoked I'd have been when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, mm. watching someone like who I am now competing at that race. And, and yeah, I mean, the sport's like that. It's, it, it attracts a certain type of person. It's a certain kind of crazy, I think, to kind of, to get through the winters, yeah, um, it's, it can be uh, pretty grim at times, but yeah, no, we're we're really fortunate. We got a lot of good people in our sport. And from that age, as a teenager, then, how did you identify like the next steps for you, like with that goal in mind to to get to the Olympics, and you you had that kind of touchstone at, at your club? What were the next steps for you? Was it like going to a university where you could? still do that or were there other options to go into careers and that was still a hobby or how did you kind of map that out i think it's it's looking at those stepping stones um that i mentioned earlier you know just you know the next division the junior team making these kind of hitting these these goals along the way so you know i remember when i was 14 i made the top division um in the uk the, and around that time i think it's when you're the year you turn 15 is the first year you're allowed to race internationally. Okay. So from that year, it was like, well, now I want to make the junior team. Mm. Um, which, yeah, I did that age 15. And then it's all of a sudden it's, well, now I want a junior medal. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it was just that, really. There was always sort of a next step that wasn't too far away. Yeah. Um, I did go to uni. I actually left home uh, when I was 16. So I moved to Nottingham. Um, I was put up with a family there. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I didn't know that part. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's huge. So um, this family was looking after me. I did my A-levels in Nottingham. Uh, it was where British Canoeing was based at the time, mm -hmm. the National Water Sports Centre there. So, yeah, I mean, I lived there for six years in the end. Did you? So after I finished my A-levels there, I went to Nottingham Trent University. Yep. And 
you know, being able to to study and paddle alongside, I think, you know, was was really useful. Um, mm. It's something that still I think is really important to kind of have a second focus. Yeah. Because I mean, whatever we're doing, especially if we're pursuing high performance in something, mm -hmm. you know, there's probably a lot more bad days than there are good days. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if one if one area is not quite motivating you and lighting you up at that time mm. then hopefully the other thing you're pursuing is yeah exactly do you have a do you actually have a definition of high performance yourself no i'm not sure i do actually um that's a really interesting question <laughs> it, it's, it's just gone off script and it just popped yeah. into my head and i just thought i wonder what your definition of that can let that permeate and, yeah uh, and come back <laughs> i'm gonna but, think uh, about that one I mean, I always heard a lot about, you know, um, kids when they were signed on by different football clubs that they would move away from home mm. and move in with, with a family in those kind of formative years. But you, you're one of those people mm. that did that with, with canoeing. Um, were there many people from um, your kind of cohort at that age that you've seen come all the way through with you or have they all kind of fallen by the wayside? Yeah, there's, there's two of us from my club. So okay. my teammate, Joe Clark, he, he won the Olympics in Rio in 2016 in yeah. kayak, the other discipline. Yeah. We went to school together. We started at the club together. We're both still competing now. So right. that's that's really nice to have. Yeah, yeah. Um, at that age, yeah, there were loads of us. Mm. And you do sort of see that drop out in sport around 16, yeah. 18. And then sort of there's another one kind of like between like 21 and 23 yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. various reasons you know that mm. they are pretty formative years it's interesting isn't it because again i've never reached like the, those kind of levels but for me the highlight was um when i was at bath uh at uni and it playing um for bath rugby club mm. third team not first team but blocking me was like the england back row <laughs> at, at the time and then the second team i was number seven and the second team number seven was the number one number seven for the whole british universities mm. and it was just like literally going to the most <laughs> successful club in england but um i dropped out at that that mm. age like 23 something like that 22 23 that year or two after university um I was seeing something the, the other day, again, whether it was a social media clip or a podcast, but it said, you know, to get to the top, you need um, natural talent, you need technique, and then you need that consistency of turning up every day and mm. putting the work in. Would you say you've you've got all, all those three? You talked about technique early in the discipline you're in. Yeah. You say you're born with like, natural talent and you've clearly stuck at it and put the work in. <laughs> I'd say so. I think I think timing as well. Okay. I'd add to that list. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, because yeah, you've you've got to be in the right place at the right time sometimes with these things. Me raising my hand in that classroom, um, being involved in the sport at the right era where there's the support around yes, you. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, we're 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 pretty volunteer led, particularly at club level. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to have a great coach when I first started um, in Andy Neve, so. But yeah, I think those other attributes, um, for sure. I was always curious. I think that's it. I think that's the thing that gets me through is my curiosity. I like that one as well. Yeah, always be I always want to learn. Yeah. Um, I ask, I question everything, probably to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> I like that though. I like people who do that rather than just take what's read mm. down to them, you know, and, and kind of analyze it, look at it from different angles and is that going to work for me? Is mm. it not going to work for me? Um, nice. And, and before everything got, you know, pretty crazy as a, as a professional athlete for yourself, um, you know, when you were at university, what was the vision? You're obviously working at the National Centre there, which, as you say, timing wise mm. and having those resources, which wouldn't have been there 20, 30 years ago. Um, what was that that vision for yourself? Um, you, you mentioned since a young age was it like 12 years old mm. you thought, oh, i wanted to be an olympian how did you did you have a, a plan that you know you and your parents or you and your coach or all of those kind of sat down and and looked at it that this is what we need the metrics we need to hit to kind of reach that it's tricky in canoe slalom because you know there's no world records every race is different there's yeah. not a certain time you can aim for even you know, we we look at certain benchmarks in the gym and things like that. In reality, even that stuff doesn't really matter. People go about the sport in so many different ways. 
when I was growing up, the two guys that dominated um, was a guy from France, a really tall, quite lanky guy, and a guy from Slovakia, short, stocky guy. Hmm. Between them, they won everything. And they were always separated by tenths of a second. And it, it really showed that, you know, there's just so many different ways to do canoe slalom. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in terms of planning, yeah, of course, there's kind of, there was certain um, milestones to hit and ones that were important to hit to stay within the system. So, mm -hmm. you know, to stay on a funded program, that means hitting a result internationally pretty much every year. Okay. Um, so as as a junior, it was to make the the final at Junior World Championships. As an under 23, again, it's making finals. Um, the final year you race, you have to win a medal um, or already be, be performing at a senior level. So... Yeah, it was it was one of them. I guess as a, as soon as I graduated from the juniors, I had my eye on the senior team. There's in, in canoe slalom we compete at under twenty three level as well. Yeah, to kind of bridge that gap, and I mean all through those years I was chasing the seniors down. But I guess it was kind of through those years where I had my first real obstacles. Okay. Um, everything was going very well, and I guess like to plan. Until you were how Until old? I was, I was nineteen in twenty twelve. Okay. So that year, I made senior team reserve, picked up a couple of senior races, my first World Cups, mm -hmm. um, finished fourth at a very difficult senior World Cup, which was a big standout result for someone my age, and you know, really sort of it shocked a few people, got my name out there. Nice. Only a couple of weeks after that, I had a disc injury. And, you know, that, what followed there, it was months. It, it was a good sort of year and a half to two years to get back, I think. Wow. And um, how, how much of that were you kind of incapacitated and how much was like rehab? So this was the thing. It was kind of in and out of right. training, trying to work out what was going on here. Okay. Um, eventually it was early 2013, um, you know, when it, we had scans and it came back that I had a stress fracture, needed to just stop and actually like take some serious time off. Mm. So yeah, spent most of the summer in 2013 not competing, um, difficult year. And then, yeah, coming back into it, all of us, I've always been the top kind of for my age group or there or thereabouts around my age. And all of a sudden, I'm coming back, and I'm not anymore. Mm. Um, tricky thing to deal with. Yeah, but so how did you deal with it? Um, I think I just, I just always believed that I would come back. I think I was, you know, yeah, I, I, I knew I'd come good. And what was sort of carrying me a little bit at the time was I was also competing in doubles. I don't talk about this too much these no, days. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. it's, it's yeah, actually quite okay. a huge part of my <laughs> my life, my doubles career with my friend Greg. But yeah, no, that was from 2010 to 2015. Um, the doubles was taken out of the Olympic program after Rio. I was saying, um, right, that was so, my next question. Yeah, <laughs> so we retired in 2015 from that. Right. But um, we were already making the senior team um from 2011 in that mm -hmm. so uh, i think it, again it was causing me problems because i feel like the british canoeing program at the time especially after my injury kind of saw me as a doubles athlete yeah yeah you know but it was always the canoe singles that was my passion um but all of a sudden these other two guys are <laughs> racing better than me at the time so yeah i just had to get back and it was great because, so in this the same year before my injury, 2012, I think, um, I had a two-second penalty, which kept me off the podium at under 23 World Champs. Um, 2014, that first year about racing, I was probably on the winning run uh, and then blew it right at the end. 2015, my last chance to race at under 23, I finally won it. Right. Um, we were Amazing. in um, Foz de Guazú in Brazil. Um, first world title. And it was also the year I finally made the senior team for the first time. So, yeah, things were largely back on track at that point. Um, but 
I mean, yeah, I mean, more, more injury upsets, actually, for the following two or three years. And, and do you think, I mean, I don't know, again, what the doctors or consultants said to you, but like when you, you had that stress, stress mm. fracture, um, was it, had your body kind of caught up with the growth that it needed to do to be, you know, physically strong in that sport? Mm. Was it training too much or is it like it could be a million and one things? Yeah, so many different things. Right. Um, I mean, <laughs> exercise is good for you. Yeah. I'm not sure sport is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. competitive sport as well. Being yeah. really, you know, we're not we're not designed to be that specific at something. Um, mm. you know, and canoe in particular, you know, I'm I'm on my knees in that boat, sat kind of down between my heels. Yeah. Um it's asymmetrical. I'm only paddling on one side of the boat. Um so that's not particularly good for us <laughs> either. Good for your body, There's no. a lot of rotation going on. Um the water, I mean, at Lee Valley, where I train now, that's getting pumped. There's 11 QMEX, um, 11 tons of water per second, essentially, are going down that river. Wow. It's powerful. Yeah. You know, if, if if you hit it in the wrong place, then then you know about it. So shoulders, necks, backs, elbows, they're the kind of vulnerable areas for us. Mm. And clearly, you, you must have a really positive mindset to, to get you through that. Where, where does that come from? Um, I don't know where it comes from, but it's just something I've always had. I think, you know, again, maybe to a fault, I, I get over things really quickly. Okay. Um, you know, I, I often, I very quickly see the kind of silver lining to situations, um, which is, you know, it's, it's a great trait to have. Mm. Um, yeah, sometimes it can maybe... It can maybe seem a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like disconnected or mm -hmm. um, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I think I kind of, yeah, I think the hardest thing with injury is if, is if you don't know what it is yeah. and you don't know how to get better. Um, I think, you know, with the back, it was like, cool, it's bone. Bones heal in around six weeks. Mm. Cool, there you go. Yeah, then you yeah. rehab it. Um, the tricky one for me, it was, it was 2017 rehabbing a shoulder injury and this kept me out for ages and we just could not get to the cause of it. Right. There were times where I couldn't even get dressed. I couldn't put a t-shirt on. My shoulder was hurting that much, but at the same time, if I could get on the water, it wasn't hurting to train. Oh, really? It was, it was so strange. Um, and eventually, you know, we, we just had to stop. Uh, I was waking up in the morning in agony with it every day. And I mean, I'm sure we're going to come on to it to talk about the breathing, but this is yeah. how, this is how it started for me mm. was one physio pointed out that I was maybe breathing too much out of my upper chest. And it was in correcting that, that the shoulder pain started to go away. Okay. Interesting. And given that you were at that national training center, um, what kind of support did you receive like, with the rehabilitation and how did that affect the program that you were on at the time? Mm, so we're, we're a well-supported um, team at British Canoeing. Um, we've always got world-class practitioners um, in sports medicine, physio, strength and conditioning. Um, yeah, to be honest, I mean, with that injury, once we, once we cracked it, it didn't take long to get better. Right. It was just get into the root cause of it. Mm. But um, I think it it did change a little bit the way I trained because this was over winter and I was coming back into training around, I think it was around four weeks out from our British selection trials, having not really trained much over winter. Um, it's still very competitive at this point to get on the team. And I was like, look, this is this is what we've got now. There's, we've got four weeks. I'm not going to get any better at canoeing in that time. The only thing that matters is that I'm putting runs down when it counts. I need to do two runs a day at selection that are good. Um, and I changed my training accordingly. I was like, well, that's how, exactly how I'm going to train every day until selection. I put a lot of pressure on my performance in training and was really replicating the same skills. Mm. And again, it, it's something seeing the positive and bringing that out again was the injury taught me that. The injury put me in a position where 
I didn't have a choice. I just had to learn to perform mm -hmm. when it counted. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that our injuries can, can teach us just as much and we can come back stronger. Um, you know, the way that it, it, it taught me to breathe better in particular, that, that changed the rest of my career, um, for sure. Interesting. And, and do you, do you think you put a lot of pressure on yourself? Um, at times, at times, I think, you know, even to this day, you know, I, I'm not a senior world champion. Um, I've not won enough medals for how good I am. And I, I feel that, and that's, that's only pressure that I'm putting on myself. And is that you saying that, or is that fed back from coaches and support? Um, a little bit of a combination. Okay. Not in like a threatening way. No, from no, no. Coaches. But this, yeah, um, potential. Just, you know, I, I know, and it, it's something I, I'm, I'm really proud of. And, you know, I think if my career ended tomorrow because of an injury, I, I'd, I'd be happy. I'd be content that I've done enough. But, you know, I, I know I'm well respected around the world for what I do. Mm -hmm. That's something I'm, I'm really proud of. I bet. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's unfinished business. Um, you know, fourth at Olympic Games as well. Uh, agonizingly close there. Was it 0.16? Point... 0.16. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the one thing mm. that kind of softens the blow for that was that, you know, I, I didn't have the final run that I wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'd had a blinder of a run and finished fourth, it, that would have been hard to take. Yeah. Uh, I didn't feel like I deserved a medal that day. Um, the the guy on, on the podium in bronze, you know, he, same, he wasn't particularly happy with his performance, I think, as well. Really? Um, just happy to sneak on the podium that yeah. day. Just the nature of how that race went. Mm. It was a very hard course and a lot of people were making mistakes. And do you, did you feel that you you left everything out there, that you gave it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my final run just from pretty early on, on um, well, when I started gate five or six, things started unraveling. Um, you know, I just didn't get into my rhythm and mm. that, that can happen in slalom sometimes. Um, you can get a bad surge of water or, you know, just cut something a little bit too tight here. And I think previously, I don't think I'd have held that run together at all. That would have been a disaster of a run. Okay. okay. So I was immensely proud that I just, I put something on the board. I went into first yeah. and I had a time on the board that people had to come and beat. Yeah. You know, I crossed the line, I saw the time and it was like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's not the best that probably won't hold up, but it, it just might. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, no, on, uh, on that day, sadly not. And what was your expectation going in? I was there to win it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred okay. percent. Um, you yeah. know, every start line I'm on, um, it's, it's why I do it. I'm there to win. Um, and you were always confident that you're going to win. Um, no, I don't. I think in in canoe slalom, it's it's a strange one because it is it is one of those sports where like no one wins like every time. Mm -hmm. You do you do need that little bit of luck as well. So I think what is probably more accurate is is confident that. I had all the tools to win and confident that I have all the tools to win mm. when I sit on that start line. Yeah. Um, it really is just a game for the next 90 seconds. Um, can you stay in the moment? Mm. Um, can you respond um, well to everything that goes on? Because you are, you're constantly just responding to um, challenges that come up. You know, you can't really have a plan in slalom. There's a certain element of where you're making space and, you know, some decisions that you make before you go. Mm -hmm. But really, it's it's a game of um, being adaptable. Okay. And and how do you stay in that moment? I try to keep it really simple. So I just think about where I'm looking. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the one element to my to my plan that I do before I get on is I'll decide where I'm going to be looking um in any given moment they're my cues okay yeah yeah and as soon as i notice that i'm i'm out i'm not not in that that flow state 
whether it's because I've made a mistake or touched a pole, taken a penalty, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I've heard my name on the commentary or heard that I'm <laughs> three seconds up on the split time or something. Yeah. Um, or, or just done a move really well. That's mine. I think because I enjoy it so much. They're, that's my biggest risk area is when I've actually just pinned a move and I know it. I've got to have a really good cue in to be like, okay, well, I'm looking over there and yeah. then I'm back in. Um, and that's that's essentially pretty much all I do in training these days is just work that skill. Okay. And when you're at any race, um, how easy it f- is it for you to to get into that flow state, to, to get into that moment? Does, does everything have to be perfectly aligned or are there like a couple of things that mm. – and, and that kind of – would lead me onto talking about breath work later on, but yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> funnily enough. Yeah, no, the breathing's a big part of it for me. Um, combination of of breathing and and self talk. Mm. You know, that last sort of five to ten minutes before I race is is kind of like ritual now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And got it down. And even even if I'm still feeling nervous or not quite right, five minutes before I know that. It's 90 seconds before I start, I splash my face with water six times. And I just know that from that moment, it's going to be all right. Love that. <laughs> and, and where does that come from? Uh, it have to, I did it. I was probably splashing my face five times and accidentally did six once <laughs> and had a really good race. <laughs> yeah, Brilliant. And, and talk to me about that, the kind of greater experience itself of being at at the Olympics, um, you know, how did how did that feel? Um, we've got as we were, as we are recording today, twelve months mm. to the day to Paris for the opening ceremony. You said, yeah, um, yeah. So, what was it like being there? Like, what emotions did you feel? Did it did it feel like, yeah, this feels like home, or did it feel like completely surreal, or somewhere in between? Uh, yeah, I mean, a combination of both. I think by the time we got there, yeah. To to start with, I mean, I earned my spot. It was the end of 2019, and we had an absolute whirlwind of a week. We flew out to Tokyo, I think it was within a week um, of qualifying for our first training camp. And, yeah, I, I remember one key moment was one of the evenings on that training camp, the rest of the team didn't want to go out for dinner. Um, they all had to watch their calories a bit more than I do. <laughs> One of those. Uh, so I went out on my own and it was probably one of the first times I was actually on my own since qualifying. And I, I do, I was cycling back from that meal sort of just like, whoa, like this is actually happening. Like really sort of needing to pinch myself because it was it was just such a roller coaster through that selection series that was brutal, and then next thing we know we were we were on a plane and you know we'd been announced as um, the team at um, an event at like the foreign office the day we flew. Um, yeah, it was just crazy, and and Tokyo itself as well, like just mad city, isn't it? Isn't it? It was yeah. it was wild, and I really was like, whoa, like I think it was more. It was more, I think, that that ten year old kid that started, it's like he realized. It's like that's me. I'm I'm doing this. Mm. I think that's what it was that I felt in that moment. Um but then yeah, I mean by the time the race came around, just, you, I think because of COVID as well, obviously it was a different games. It it very much felt like right, you know, we've got a job to do now. Right, we're here. Um, it's like any other race. Mm. Um, just the stakes were a lot higher. Yeah, but the way I warm up, the way I interact with my coach, everything's the same. Um, so yeah, no, it, it it felt. I was I was surprised how relaxed I was. Really. Um, yeah. The most nervous, I, all the, the only time I was really aware of whether I was nervous or not was for the first run in heats. I remember being in the start pool and thinking, actually, I, I'm, like, I'm really, I'm really chilled out about this. Yeah. And, you know, it was a strange event with um, not having the crowd there. Mm. 
Um, I say it, not too strange for a canoe slalom event, to be honest. Um, you know, by the time you've got the volunteers and all the support staff and other athletes on the banks, mm. it felt relatively normal for us. Yeah. Um, but just above where the clock that counts us down to our start time was, was the main TV camera that was looking at us in the start pool. So I looked over to sort of check the countdown and noticed that this TV camera is right above it. And I think it was that moment that I was like, whoa, like a lot of people are watching this. And I think I felt the kind of intensity of what that moment meant uh, mm. there. But yeah, no, I was, I was so relaxed. That's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, and just kind of rewinding a little bit then, once, you know, you just mentioned it yourself, you know, that, that 10 year old boy um, who wanted to be, um, at an Olympics, winning at an Olympics. Um, and you kind of talked through the the steps that, that led you to being there and then, you know, seeing that camera. Um, was there a screw it, just do it moment um, on that journey? Was it when you, when you kind of reflect back, was it literally mm. you putting your hand up in class or was it something else between that moment and you being in the pool there at the Olympics? I mean, I think that's definitely one. Mm. for sure, just to start the sport in the yeah. first place. But in terms of going to the Olympic Games, yeah, it has to be just after our 2018 season finished, there was three of us in Great Britain who were top 10 in the world. We knew around a year later, one of us would be selected for the Olympic Games. <laughs> I felt like on paper in that moment, I was probably third. Really? And, 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 and my teammate, you know, Ryan at the time, I think he was probably the best in the world at that time. And we had a world championships in Rio. I had asked my team manager to get me a later flight home. And I ended up, I spent a few weeks in South America and I came back from that and I, I went to visit my parents and I remember this is, this is mad. It still kind of freaks me out that this happened, but I was, I was driving back down the M6, back down to London, ready to start my winter training ahead of, you know, the most important season really of my career. And I just had this vision of me at the world championships at the end of the season. And I just qualified the spot for Tokyo. And yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but I was so overcome by the emotion of it. It really felt like I just qualified for the Olympics. Hmm. And this is, this is almost 12 months out. Yeah. And it was so real. I'm bawling my eyes out. I had to pull over. I stopped at like the next services to just sort of try and compose myself for the drive. And if there was a moment where I was like, screw it just do it. it was that it was like yeah like this is happening wow. and i just put myself back in that moment every day after that right i was like i'm gonna get really comfortable with what that feels like yeah and really just believe it because yeah there was nothing between the three of us mm. we, we all deserve to go to the yeah. olympic games you know we were all at that level it's just a shame in can you slalom that only one gets to go yeah but you know, I think it was probably that belief that edged it for me. And are those uh, two guys still in the sport? So one's retired. So yeah. he'd been to the previous three games. Is that um, Ryan? This was David. So he David, he okay. retired um, last year now or year before last year. And then um, Ryan, um, we're about the same age. Yeah, he's still going. It's between us two for, for this next one. For Paris. Okay. <laughs> Got you, got you. And, um, you know, that emotion, the, mm. the, are you an emotional person? Does that just come from nowhere? Uh, no, I think, yeah, it, it doesn't take too much to set me off, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Does the anthem set you off? I get it from that? my mom, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and talk us through a little bit um, what does day in the life of professional canoeing athlete look like for you you've um, you, you say literally one minute commute to, <laughs> to training now etc so are you fully you're obviously fully immersed in the sport you've got 12 months to, to kind of count down mm -hmm. so um, 
is that, yeah, talk us to a day in the life of a professional canoeing athlete and, and what else is there that you can kind of fit into your life? Mm. So at the moment, yeah, I, I recently moved into a house that's literally on the venue um, <laughs> that I train at, which is is amazing. So, yeah, I mean, my day starts around 7. Um, I get over to the Whitewater Centre for around 8, start warming up. So we always warm up in the gym first. Then we warm up out on the water. Um, after white water in the morning, I'm straight in the gym. And then, you know, I, I, I finish the morning up around sort of half 11, 12 ish. Um, after we've also got, would have, I'd have probably done the gym and then gone and watched my video back from the session. Okay. Um, sometimes I do it the other way around, but yeah. And then lunch, if it's a hard day and I've got nothing else going on, I get a nap at nice. that time. Um, and then, yeah, more white water in the afternoon. That's a normal day, you know, wraps up around four. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like having a normal job, really. That's yeah, like yeah, an eight yeah. till four day. Um, without, the, without the nap. Without the nap, yeah. I was, I was just reading um, <laughs> Dan Carter's autobiography and um, All Black Number 10, and um, he was saying they'd always have 20-minute Mm. naps as well yeah even if i don't fall asleep i yeah. think that's one of the most useful things that i do in my day mm. um i quite often do it with headphones listen to either binaural beats um or like a yoga nidra or something like this yeah 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 okay um and is it any different i'm thinking it's not because of the way you've you kind of talked already is it, is it different for a world cup or an olympics or do you literally train as if if oh, I see the actual training sessions yeah. themselves. So yeah. big variety, really. Um, okay. So like the actual event in canoe slalom, um, in training terms, we'd call it a full run. So when you race from top to bottom, yep, yep. it's, you know, between 90 and 100 seconds. Uh, we do variations of that distance throughout the week. So quarters, thirds, halves, fulls, uh, multiple runs of this or what we generally just call tech or technique you might um you might just stay in like one section of the river just doing three or four gates mm -hmm. just repeating them usually there's a bit of a theme there's be something in particular we're working on and we just look at that um loops loops my favorite session loops is just you just keep going around okay round around around <laughs> um you know 12 to 15 full runs but at a slightly reduced pace. Mm. Um, yeah, and then obviously in the gym, a bit of a mixture. Um, it's, 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 you know, mostly weights, mostly upper body, press, pull, chin, main exercises. Most of us in the men's, um, at the top level, you kind of, I'm pretty sure pretty much all of us on the program, we're doing a pull up with ourselves plus our body weight again on a chain for a one rep max. Mm. Um, that's that's uh yeah that's kind of our most important um metric that we look at in there and that's what you're going through day in day out now yeah so we're yeah. straight back into it so obviously um in the build-up to races we kind of do less and less volume um i strip out the gym as well quite far out from the season mm. um so i stopped in march um for the first half of the season we've got a bit of a break now so I'm back in the gym. Literally started again this week. Right. Um, so yeah, we're in a heavy block again right now. Um, well, that'll take me up until basically end of August. And okay. then we start to taper it down again. But yeah, as you get close to the race and you do less and less, it's like being on holiday. <laughs> Just train like one hour a day. Yeah, yeah, taper um, down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that from my marathon last year. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and talk to me again. So that's the training schedule. Where do you incorporate then things like yoga and breath work, which you, you discovered when, mm. you, when you got that, that shoulder injury that, that you talked about? Um, it, tell me a little bit more about how that happened, um, how that helped you, and you know, where that, that pra those practices are in your life today. Mm. So, I mean, those injuries when I was in my early 20s, you know, we sort of joke now, but the more I say it, the more I think my body listens as well. We sort of say, you know, I, I get more robust with age. Yeah, this is okay. the line that I find I keep saying, and I'm like, oh, actually, I, I keep repeating that. 
probably a good thing to say. But, you know, I kind of had all my injury trouble when teammates weren't, when they were getting away with stuff. Mm. And I think I learned at that age that I've really got to look after myself. Mm. And that's why I'm going to have another 10 years of, of my sport. I'm going to be going till yep. I'm 40. Um, yeah, with the yoga. So the yoga was actually... Um, it's kind of it was like my introduction to breathing, I guess. Yeah. Um, in 2017, it 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 fits in um, when I can do it. I like a strong practice, um, so I practice. I, I teach a little bit of uh, rocket yoga, very um, playful practice. It's kind of like vinyasa, mm-hmm. um, based on uh, the Ashtanga sequence. Um, but yeah, a lot of arm balances, inversions. Um, it's not a practice that I can do regularly alongside training because it is so physical. Yeah. Um, because I train Monday to Friday, um, if I can get a rocket in on the weekend just to keep moving, I kind of mm. see that I do that on a recovery day. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, again, like rockets, the, the yoga that we want, but w- the yoga we need is more of these meditative, yeah, yeah. uh, yin like yeah. practices. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'll know when my body needs it, when I'm, when I'm really flagging mm. and I've got a couple more days to get through till the weekend. That's usually when, um, when I can get a good sort of slow yin practice in with the breathing. It's, I'm at the point now, you know, I don't feel like I have a set breathing practice. I don't need to put time aside in my day to do that. Okay. The breathing that that I do, what I'm interested in, what I teach, it's more about, you know, I'm interested in how someone's breathing 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to breathe in any given moment and I want other people to know how to breathe in any given moment. So, yeah, I guess that either means I don't have a breath practice or I constantly have a breath practice yeah 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 you know <laughs> yeah, true 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 we're always doing it all of us so yeah yeah okay and um question that um always ask our guests is are you where you wanted to be like when you set out and you you were a 10 year old boy in class um and then at, you know i think you said like 12 years old having somebody in your club who'd been mm. to the olympics and you wanted to do you wanted to do that um, I think I kind of know the answer, but are, are you where you initially wanted to be in life? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just the fact that, you know, it, it even take the Olympics out of it, the fact that I'm still going canoeing every day. Yeah, and it's your career. It's my career. Life, That's it for yeah. me, you know. if For as long as I can do this, um, mm. then, yeah, that, I'll be doing it. <laughs> and is that where the drive comes to want to put another decade in and go to another couple of games, et cetera? Um, I think so, yeah. It's split. It's kind of half and half. It's just the sheer enjoyment of it. It, it is the coolest sport. You know, if, if you've not seen Canoe Slalom before, people listening then, you know, check it out. You can come watch us live, actually. Mid-September, we've got the World Championships in London. Amazing. Okay. Um but I'll look out there's that, but then also, yeah, you know, there's, there's unfinished business. Um, you know, I know I've got more medals in me, so, um, yeah, I'm going to keep racing. Amazing. And is it safe to say that the, the goalposts have shifted a little bit? Is there a new vision, new goals, um, that you have relating to breath work? Um, last weekend or the weekend before, um, you're at community mm. Russell brands, um, three day festival teaching breath work with a, a, again, amazing array of speakers, including Wim Hof mm. and uh, loads of other people that you'd be able to quote to me. Yeah. Um, for sure. I mean, I, a good piece of advice I got, when I was quite young and I don't actually remember where it was from, but I, I think I might have even said it already. Like, you know, I think having a second focus yes, yeah, yeah. is good, but also you can probably do two things well. Mm. I wouldn't want to stretch and maybe take on something else at the same time. But uh, having these two parts to my life are, are really interesting, really complementary. You know, the more I'm learning about breathing, 
as much as it is about health and longevity, that's the kind of, that's why I'm sharing it. That's why I want to teach. There, there is of course a performance element. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's crossover, you know, I'm learning from the breath to help my sport. Um, the fact that I've been to Olympic games, the fact that, you know, I don't just know the science and all of that, the fact that I'm using this stuff still, I'm not a retired athlete. Mm. I'm still here competing at the highest level. That gives me so much credibility as a breath teacher. Yes. Um, yes. so having both at the same time, yeah, it's, it's really complimentary. And, um, I guess the goal with it in terms of goalpost shifting, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, if the worst happened and I wasn't supported in the same way I am now by UK sport or something like that, mm -hmm. that I'd be able to support myself um, yeah. with the business. Interesting because different people that I've, I've spoken to, especially over the last year, and I, I remember chatting to Alex Good, um, Saracens fullback, England international, and um, he was either 34, just about to turn 35, something like that. Um, and this was back in spring this year, 2023. And um, we literally segued off into conversation. Mm. And um, he was literally, I have no idea what I want to do. Mm. After this, I have no idea if I'm going to have a contract next year. Since then, he's had the contract renewed, but just for 12 months, you know. And, um, you know, some of the questions I asked him were, do you not talk about it amongst the other players? He was like, no, mm. <laughs> no. And I was like, you know, the, the most successful club in England over the last 15 years, I was like, surely the support must be there. They're doing courses, they're putting things in front of you. And he was just like, I want to do this for as long as I can, but I've no idea what else I'm going to do. And mm. that, that really threw me, you know, but it ended up in a really interesting probably 40 minute segue into the conversation because <laughs> I just wasn't expecting yeah, it from someone yeah. at the kind of peak of their peak of their game who mm. just won the English Premiership again that he didn't know what he wanted to do but for you um quite young as, as an athlete mm. 29 30 or you started thinking about it before then even didn't you yeah I guess so um yeah I think around the same time that I kind of got into this whole breathing thing um, it was when I was injured and I remember sort of going through just like a, a bit of something with just almost like feeling guilty mm -hmm. that of how, how amazing it was that I was just going canoeing every day and how lucky I was. And there was a sense of kind of, it's got to be about a bit more than this. Mm. And so, yeah, for a long time now, I've wanted to kind of share that experience you know, you do anything for 20 years, you learn a bit of something, yeah. um, you know, about about what it is to kind of be human or human performance, like whatever it is. And, you know, I dabbled, I've done bits and bobs, speaking workshops here and there, but it, it wasn't until the breath really kind of gripped me um, that... I think because I studied sports science at university as well, I mm. kind of had that to draw on. Mm. Um, that it really felt like I had something where I had a bit more authority on it and value to share. Yeah, and that's that feels good. That's that's a big why for me now. Mm. Big why for me for selection ahead of Paris is that. You know, because it, it, it's the, what I teach is so simple. It's the simplest stuff. And I'm often met with like surprise. Like, why didn't I know this? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it should be taught in schools. Simple as. And I'd love it to be taught in schools. I know that if I win a medal in Paris next year, that becomes a lot easier to make happen. When you win a medal in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> when? Yeah. So that could that could become a whole new mission mm. to get it into schools. And there's a few things like that, isn't there? You know, with actually teaching kids what um, 
what finance and what money actually is, yeah. not teaching you to learn numbers off the top of your head, mm. uh, you know, to just repeat them ad nauseum and, and dates in history and things <laughs> like that. But no, I, I love that. And would it be safe to say then with, without that injury that you, you wouldn't have discovered breathwork or do you think it's something that you might have? I don't know. It's, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Mm. And I even to be honest, You'd be surprised the knowledge of this stuff in sport isn't great. Really? Um, so do you feel it's a bit of a superpower that you've, that you've yeah, got the your Yeah, yeah. yeah amazing. Um, I, I mean, that. I'm not, not afraid to say it. Athletes, as a general rule, aren't great breathers. Right. You'd be surprised. You'd, mm. you'd think they'd be the best. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, being an athlete, what just the training, the lifestyle, when you understand this stuff, you realize it sets you up mm. to not be great at breathing. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was my mum who, after I told her that the physio had said, you know, she thought I was breathing too much out the top of my chest. I wasn't really given much direction on what to do about it. Okay. Because it's just not really known. Yeah. Um, in certain professions, you know, or, or, or disciplines, or they're interested in, in one aspect of breathing, but there's, there's kind of a lot to it. We've got to tackle the chemistry, the mechanics, Mm. the pace, the kind of the psychological relationship to it. Um, and it was my mum who suggested I went to yoga. And that's when it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Always listen to mum. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, I went to her yoga class and, yeah, just and found it really hard. Yeah. Um, it, like in a room full of women that were just so strong and able yeah. to do it. And I think as an athlete, you kind of go one or two ways there you can kind of, your ego takes a hit. Yeah, run for the hell. And you go, this is rubbish. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or you yeah. go, wow, I'm bad at this yeah. and there's something in this for me. Yeah. And that's and that's what it was. Um, hmm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, and I always remember my, um, my uncle's running coach at Cardiff Athletics Club, so coaching that Colin Jackson era athletes there. And like when I started running, and I was training for New York Marathon last year and I was just I just can't seem to improve. I, I've literally just like PBing like every week for about four months and then literally nothing now for months. And he was just like, focus on your breathing. Mm. I was like, breathing? What's breathing got to do with anything? I'm running. <laughs> it's my legs. <laughs> and as soon as I did that, again, kind of read into it. He didn't give me mm. much direction, but actually read into it and um, different ball game. Yeah. Different ball game. Yeah. Um, and in general, then, what have been some of the biggest takeaways from from your journey that you'd like to share with with others who are who are listening um, to the show on how they could get from where they are to where they want to be in life? The one that I'm there's there's two things that I'm really kind of mulling over at the moment, and it's being aware that your biggest strength can also be your biggest weakness. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in other places as well. And then I, I kind of see it in myself with how my season started this year. Um, that's what I'm going to tackle and take on for the second half of the season. It's going to be much better. And also you, you've got to take risks. Yeah. You need to take risks and you know step out of of what's normal yeah. yeah question question things and take risks i think again the reason why i'm kind of really that seems so relevant to me at the moment is always been very good at questioning asking why but also can sometimes get stuck in this is how this is how i do things i've, I've asked why already yeah. And I've come to this and maybe it is a bit different to what other people are doing, but this is how I'm doing it. Um, and it can feel like a risk to sort of change direction. Mm. But I think it's some of the All Blacks, um, one of their philosophies, they say um, adapt even when you're on top. Yeah. And then they kind of say underneath that, especially when you're on top. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And yeah, I'm thinking about both of those things a lot at the moment. Yeah, and, and I think having just read a, a bit in um, Dan Carter's book, again, that came, 
I think it was, and I remember I was, I was there, I actually watched that game live, 2007, when, when France beat them and they'd beaten France twice that year already, mm -hmm. once by like 60 points or something like that. And they just, you know, hadn't changed anything. They just, just assumed, mm. again, this is the way we're training, it's going well, we're blowing everybody away, we're not changing anything. And then after that, everything changed. You know, and everything was questioned. And then the players ran it. The coaches didn't run it because mm. they took accountability for that as well. And I thought absolutely, um, absolutely loved that. Mm -hmm. um, and who or what could you not have done without on this on this journey, other than a canoe, perhaps? <laughs> um, I think my parents. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. That's it for sure. Yeah, you know, if, if you want to, in elite sport, when for, for a lot of us, you, you always have to have started young. Mm. Something as technical as what we do as well. And then, yeah, at that age, is, it's impossible. Yeah, without that support. So, yeah. Good answer. Um, and if there's one piece of advice you'd give to that eight, nine, ten year old <laughs> self looking back now, 20 plus years later, what, what could it be? Just to keep enjoying it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to... Uh, yeah, if I could... I, I'd love to sort of say to them, to that kid, me, <laughs> then, like, you've, you've found something here. This is it. This is what you're meant to do. Because I probably didn't know it at the time. But, yeah, I love it. That's amazing. <laughs> um, well, look, Adam, thank you very, very much for coming in. Very busy at the moment, so I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. And um, wish you all the very best for the next 12 months and beyond. Um, what's the easiest way people can get hold of if they want to find out more about mm. the, the breath work that, um, that you've just been practicing at Russell Brand's community? Um, what's the easiest way people get hold of People can follow your, your mm. progress between here and Paris and beyond as well. Yes, yeah, so for breathing, it's inspiredbreathacademy.com. Um, it's also Inspired Breath Academy on Instagram uh, with underscores. And my athlete page is slalom underscore Burgess. Got that. Um, last question. This one was from Georgie. Uh, do you own your own canoe? <laughs> How many canoes do you have? She's a surfer, so uh, I was like, I'd probably go about 10, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I actually, I have a bit of a fleet at the moment. I got way too many. A fleet? Um, there is a new one sat in my living room as we speak, um, getting Isn't ready that? to go on the water, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> when, um, I just remember this from like my, my nephew and that, who's like rowing team team gb and um the cost of those things <laughs> and how long it takes to transport them from where they're built and all that kind of stuff is crazy yeah yeah no it's nuts um my um my sponsor jcb that came in um to support me after i got the olympic spot um yeah in 2019 they changed a lot for me and between them and now my relationship with the manufacturer um that's become a lot easier but yeah no it's uh it's it's not an easy uh, it's yeah not an easy one to get into sometimes. Where, where does a sponsor like that come from, by the way? Um, local connection. Local, local connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I'll ask this one on air, but you can think about this one. This is the last question. But if you could recommend anybody from your network, he he thinks got a great story to tell for this podcast, who would it be? Oh, that's a good question. And you can go away and come back to us on that one. Oh, um, can I give you two? Of course. Two, two people that I spent the weekend with at um, Community, uh, my friend and uh, coach, uh, Jess Farmer of Phoenix Coaching, or Phoenix, and um, our other friend, Bobby Ward, um, conscious entrepreneur, doing some amazing things. He's got some amazing plans lined up as well for the future. Bobby Farmer, did you say? Bobby, Bobby, Ward, Bobby Ward and Jess Farmer. There you go, man. Yeah. The combined. <laughs> yeah, mine. yeah, superpower. Okay, interesting. Mm. We'll look those up straight away. Um, amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching this episode of Screw It, Just Do It. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below this video. Has this episode helped move you closer to where you want to be? All that I ask is that if you enjoyed this episode and that it's moved you closer to getting to where you want to be, that you share this episode so that it helps one other person do just the same. Just ask yourself what small action will move you forward to get you from where you are, then screw it and just do it. Until next time.